for sure it would have suited me the whole my whole career and even if even if it, even if the if it had been more demanding or longer you know my my strength as an athlete was my ability to recover uh from from hard training and racing you know day after day and i i was still at that point i was i was getting near the end of my career but i i was still my body was holding together really well and so um and the other the thing that suited me down to the ground was the mountain mountain aspect of it right i was i was really good in the in the mountains uh and so, you know, I, I was I was so looking forward to it when it when it finally came around. Hi everybody, Ross here, and this is episode eight of the Streak Podcast. That was Scott Molina talking about how a triathlon stage race, especially one with longer and mountainous stages, totally suited him as an athlete. Scott was a professional triathlete from the early nineteen eighties until the mid nineteen nineties. He had 104 victories from 265 starts. He was, of course, the 1988 Hawaii Ironman champion. But he also won four overall USTS titles, the Zoffingen Duathlon and the Ombrun Ironman in 1991 and stood on the Nice podium four times. A book came out in 2021 called Slot, It was published by the French triathlon magazine TreeMag. There's a chapter in there called On a Retrouve Le Big Four, or We Found the Big Four, where they chat with Dave Scott, Mark Allen, Scott Tinley and Scott Molina. Here's something about Scott from the article that I really like. Quote, How could a guy so relaxed and nonchalant knock the other three down so often? End quote. And that's what I discovered when I got up at 4.30am on a Monday to call Scott at his place in Christchurch, New Zealand. That is, somebody super relaxed, but generous with his time and memories to help me explain today's piece of triathlon history. If you haven't listened, then episode 7 was about the Trophy SNCF, which was a two-day test event organised in 1993 as a kind of proof of concept for sponsors, the federation, the athletes and the towns that might consider hosting a stage of a future France Iron Tour. The triathlon press presented the organisational problems, but also the successes. I went through all of that in episode 7. But the overriding hope was that the race would be back and longer in 1994. Well, spoiler alert, it was. The event was initially rumoured to have eight stages in 10 days. This was published in TED magazine and mentioned by Rob Burrell on the Eurosport coverage. But at the end of August 1994, 11 teams of six men towed the line in Vichy for four stages over five days, with, like in 1993, the final stage finishing at the top of Alpe d'Huez. The French semi-pro clubs were again in attendance, these included Poissy, Andrézieux Boutillon and Saint-Quentin, who also had Rob Burrell on board. International teams were also formed and provided with a local naming sponsor. Peugeot Sachs were pretty much the German national team, with Thomas Hellriegel, Rainer Müller, Ralf Egert, Holger Lorenz, Roland Knoll and Arne Schomburg. Point P was basically the Aix-en-Provence Grand Prix team, but with Rick Wells, Stephen Foster and Canadian Frank Clark added for the Iron Tour. The rider team was mainly Belgians, Buckler were South Africans and Alp Duez had four Australians, Ben Bright, Luke Beaver, Brett Riccini and Andrew Johns, Craig Watson from New Zealand and a Frenchman, Sylvain Daflon. All teams had matching uniforms that included a race kit and a tracksuit, Peugeot also provided every team with an 806 people carrier to get the athletes from stage to stage. Scott's team was called France Info or France Info. In my opinion, they had the best kit, a well-designed combination of black, white and yellow. 
And although he had taken 1993 off, in 1994, Scott was fit and having one of his most enjoyable seasons ever. In Vichy, he was joined by Wes Hobson, Andrew Carlson, Jimmy Riccitello, Mike Pig and Simon Lessing. A super team, if you will. But no, that surely wasn't allowed, as Scott explains. The rules were, you know, uh, such that I think you had to have almost the whole team from one country if, if, if they were going to be foreigners. Now, not, not for French teams, right? And so, you, so I, I guess they came up with that rule to, you know, prevent anybody building the superstar team from around the world and killing, and killing the French. But, but in fact, that's exactly what happened uh, with, with, with our team and Simon Lessing, who was at that time the best guy in the world. That's right. It was agreed that five out of the six athletes on a team had to be from the same country. France Info had five Americans and Simon Lessing, a Brit racing with a French licence. So stage one was on Wednesday the 31st of August in Vichy. Vichy is now famous for the Iron Man event held there, but back in 1994 it was already an established triathlon town. The stage was to be a sprint distance team time trial, with teams being set off a minute apart. The triathlon team time trial was invented in France, and the first one was organised in 1992. I wondered if Scott had ever done one before. No, no, there's, there was never, in the United States, we never had anything like that, you know. I had done uh, some bike racing, which had some team time trials in it before, previously, many years before, but, um, but no, in a triathlon, certainly not. Uh, so that was... Um, that was a heck of an experience. It was wonderful because uh, your time in the team time trial counted for your overall time. And, and so with the guys that I had on that team, uh, especially on the bike with Pig, um, we were, I knew we were in a really good position to, to win the thing in the first hour of racing. We could put the race away, essentially, and, uh, which, is, which is kind of what happened. So the France Info guys knew that it was crucial to have serious team harmony and get a good start to the week, as this first hour of racing could make or break your tour. Andrew Carlson and Simon Lessing set the pace on the swim and created a draft for the other four. Carlson rolled over and did some backstroke from time to time to check everybody was on their feet. On the bike, they were determined to work hard and use this leg to put serious time on the other teams. And here's how. But all of us were good cyclists. Even, even, Andy, even Andy was a very good cyclist. Uh, he was probably the weakest of the bunch, but all the other guys were very good cyclists. Uh, but certainly when we had to yell at Pig a few times to back off, you know, just take it easy. It's just like, chill out. You know, you're killing us. You're dropping us. Um, and... Mike, you know, when he when he was excited, it was only a 20k bike, you know, and so so he was just absolutely flying. The team's overall time would be taken when their fifth athlete crossed the line after the run. So dropping a slower runner or somebody who had played a team role on the swim and bike was okay. The run leg in Vichy was also where Scott learned a new tactic from Simon Lessing. That's right, and we did lose Andy Carlson uh, during the run. But that was that was kind of calculated, uh, you know. We we said before, you know, if anybody feels like crap uh, on the on the run, uh, don't worry about it. Drop, just you know, drop back. What what wasn't in the plan was for Lessing to push people, and so that that was a complete and utter surprise during the race when Lessing started pushing the guys that were falling back, and uh, and so I I remember very distinctly. Uh, killing myself we were running about 15 30 something for 5k pace uh to start off with and um and after about oh the first first k probably uh lessing started to drop back and push the guys uh mostly um hobson and riccatello and and so he would drop back put the put his hand on their on their low back and push them right past us and then he would go back and drop back to the other guy who got dropped. And he would go and then he would push them right past us. And he did that 
he did that for 4K. And, and, and Pig and I were yelling at each, at each other, we're not going to get pushed. We're not going to get pushed. And, uh, and so it was, it was, it was incredible to see uh, how much better Lessing was than us. The result of stage one was first France Info, second Saint-Quentin, about one minute 30 seconds behind, and then Alpe d'Huez in third, nearly two minutes back. Here's Scott's analysis of the best start possible for his team. We had a good swim, good bike, good run. Um, so, it, you know, it all came together really nicely. Stage two on Thursday the 1st of September was in Lyon, a two-hour drive away that the teams did after the Vichy stage. The race took place within the Grand Parc Miribel Jonage, which is an enormous suburban lake complex on a kind of island formed by the Rhone River. At a pre-race athletes meeting, there was some debate as to whether the race should be draft legal, as it would be hard to stay separated on the flat bike course set up on the internal park roads. At the time, the concept of drafting in triathlons was completely new. The ITU had only introduced it in round two of their World Cup series in Osaka, Japan in June. And if we count the Goodwill Games in St. Petersburg and the Bordeaux indoor event, the planet had only seen maybe seven draft legal triathlons. Drafting was also still a super controversial topic. It was not something that the top athletes of the day wanted or trained for. But Scott and the France Info boys were positive and ready for it. And it was drafting. And, um, and that really played to our team strengths as well. Um, Pig was not afraid to attack. And Lessing really wasn't too worried about it because he knew he could outrun everybody anyway, no matter what happened. The French guys were, seemed quite, quite happy just to sit on. After leading the swim, Simon Lessing and Ben Bright got away on the bike eventually gaining about two minutes on a chase pack. This pack was mainly driven by Mike Pig, but it also included Molina, future 2000 Olympian Stéphane Bignet, future 2004 Olympian Stéphane Poula, and probably the best triathlon swimmer in France at the time, Laurent Janselme. On the run, Simon Lessing easily pulled away from Ben Bright to win by 1 minute 44 seconds. Scott had an excellent run on the mixed terrain course to finish third, three minutes, 22 seconds behind Lessing. So running some rough numbers after stage two, with the brief results that I've got, the overall standings were first Simon Lessing, second Scott Molina at three minutes, 22, and third equal Ben Bright and Mike Pig, three minutes, 28 seconds in arrears. This was already a huge lead for Simon Lessing after just two days, highlighting the dominance he had at the short course game back then. Stage three took place the next day, Friday the 2nd of September, in Grenoble. Remember that Grenoble was the site of the 1993 France Iron Tour test event that I talked about in episode seven. It was another two-hour drive from Lyon to Grenoble that again the teams did after the previous stage. The trip also included a stop at McDonald's for the France Info team. This stage was an evening sprint distance event, with the race due to start at 7pm. As it was on a Friday night, the organisers hoped that plenty of spectators would be out to follow the downtown swim and two-lap run. It was also in Grenoble that everybody would get their first taste of the mountains, with the entirety of the bike course being pretty much just one nine-kilometer climb and descent of the Col de Vence. Like in 1993, the swim was in the Isère River. The water temperature was about nine degrees, but the cold wasn't the only difficulty. Here's Scott's take. Not only was it freezing cold, but it was a very strong current, and they did, they did say to us, look, you cannot miss the exit ramp if you do, there's nowhere else to get out uh, for, for a long way. And so we, and, and we, it was quite a scramble. It was, a, of course, it was a huge pack. Everybody was together virtually, not Rick Wells, but, um, you know, it, after that, it was, it was pretty packed. And I think they had about two or three ladders to get out. And, and so once you got a hold of that ladder, you know, you couldn't give up your place or else you just get drift down the river. 
right? So it was, it was a real fight just to hold on to the ladder and scramble out while everybody else was trying to scramble on top of you. If you want, you can also go back and look at the 1993 Eurosport coverage that I linked to in episode 7 to get an idea of the river conditions. The bike course was already hard with the long climb, but the weather was also cold and wet. Scott was pleased when the race was over. I remember it was really, really cold, and uh, I actually struggled on the climb. It, we went straight up this big old climb, and, uh, and I, Jimmy, Jimmy Rigatella was with me at the beginning, and he just took off up the climb, and I was useless. And he, he, he is, always was a great climber, but, um, but I really struggled at the beginning, and uh, that's right. It was cold and rainy and wet and dangerous as hell. I don't even remember where I placed in the end, but I was, I was happy to get through that day, uh, you know, in one piece. Mike Pig, Simon Lessing and Frank Clark broke away on the climb. Pig attacked on the slippery descent, but Lessing lost nothing at all. Clark got dropped from the lead trio and even experienced descenders like Scott and Jimmy Riccatello lost a minute or so. Of course, Simon Lessing pulled away on the run to win his third stage in three days. Mike Pig was second and Frank Clark held on for third. Although out of the top five, Scott was pleased to outkick Rob Burrell. Notable on this day was Patrick Girard's fourth place after getting ninth with the fastest run the day before. He was now, heading into the last stage, clearly the best French athlete on GC. Not many people could beat Simon Lessing and Mark Allen in the early 1990s, but Girard, relatively unknown internationally, had done both. He outsprinted Lessing at the 1991 Coupe de France in Set before ticking the Allen box at the 1992 Haute de Seine triathlon that unfortunately became a duathlon on the day due to poor water quality. Saturday the 3rd of September was a rest day. After stage three yesterday, John Lilly, reporting for 220 magazine, wrote, quote, The only person not to look tired and haggard was Simon Lessing, who was obviously living on the buzz of wearing the race leader's jersey, end quote. Grenoble, to the ski town of Vaugenay, where the last stage was due to start, was only about an hour's drive. Once there, Scott checked out the first climb, which went from Lake Vaugenay back to the village centre, had a massage and generally got ready for the final and probably hardest stage. So stage four took place on Sunday the 4th of September and was an Olympic distance individual time trial with a twist. Existing time gaps from the first three stages would be used to determine the day's swim set-off times. Therefore, the first athlete across the line after the run at the top of Alpe d'Huez would be the winner. Spectators and TV viewers would know what overall positions the athletes were in and hopefully athlete engagement would be maintained until the end. A good concept, right? It was a good concept. Um, And it also helped eliminate drafting to a large degree because there was quite a long flat valley uh, after the Valjeunet climb and descent. Um, which was quite hard. I think it was about five or six K straight up out of the lake. And then there was a, a long valley. So at the base of the Alps. So there was a long, a long section in there that was relatively flat. And there, there probably was a bit of drafting going on, but not amongst the top 10 or so, because we were so spread out, you know. And then, of course, up the Alpe d'Huez and a super hard run at the top. So Simon Lessing dived into the not warm water four minutes, 19 seconds ahead of Mike Pig, followed by Ben Bright and then Scott Molina, still trucking in fourth. Surely Lessing wouldn't be caught. He was hoping to win four stages out of four, while Pig would be pushing gun to tape and hoping that Lessing would crack slightly on the final 12 kilometres from Bourg d'Oison to Alpe d'Huez. Climbing on the bike was a strength of Scott's, and so was running at altitude. The stage four run leg would be at 1,860 metres, and Scott had plenty of experience running hard at these altitudes, on the trails near his home in Boulder, Colorado. He was definitely hoping to push for the podium. 
but on the descent from Vosgenet to the valley, Scott hit a stone in the road and had a skidding blowout. Yeah, coming down the other side of the uh, first climb, Vosgenet, I uh, hit a rock and my tire exploded. And I was on um, 650C wheels on a, on a Quintana Roo bike. And there was two uh, support vehicles in the race. One was a motorbike, which had, I think, four or six uh, 700C wheels on the back. And so that passed me by. And I said, no, sorry, I need a uh, 650C wheel. And they go, oh, you'll have to wait for the van. And so I I sat there for quite a while, but at least I figured out that I could finish. I was quite scraped up. My hip was kind of killing me. So anyway, I waited for a wheel change and eventually one came. And, And then I just tried to work my way through the field after that. I then told Scott that John Lilly reported in 220 Magazine that the total wait for assistance was six minutes. Mm, uh, yeah, I, I'm not surprised. I mean, it seemed like an eternity, um, you know, but, uh, but after that, I had a really good race. Um, I actually had the fastest run of the day by quite a bit up in the out, uh, mostly because I, I wanted to place well, but also I was kind of pissed off about my crash. So I had a lot of adrenaline flowing. So let's look at the overall results of this historic first proper triathlon stage race. Well, Simon Lessin won all the stages and therefore also the general classification. In fact, after the Vosgenet swim, his lead increased from 4 minutes 19 seconds to 6 minutes. Mike Pig had the consolation of pulling back a minute or more on the bike, but Simon still won stage 4 on time. The overall win was worth $15,000 and a Peugeot 306 car. Mike Pig was second overall, 454 behind. Frank Clark, the now proven climber, started sixth on the last day, but had moved up to third by the finish, 958 behind the winner. Then we had Ben Bright at 12 minutes, another Australian, Stephen Foster, at 1420, and the Germans, Roland Knoll and Ralph Egert, at 1449 and 1454. After not an ideal last day, but with the fastest runner Alp Duez, Scott Molina got 8th overall. Jimmy Riccatello was 9th and Patrick Girard was proudly the first French athlete and the fastest overall runner in 10th. Of course, France Info secured the team win. Second was Point P Aix-en-Provence. Peugeot Sachs was 3rd. Poissy was the first 100% French club team in 4th. And the Belgian rider team was fifth. In fact, it was the team aspect that Scott really enjoyed in what was, up until then, a very individual sport. I thoroughly enjoyed the whole experience. We had so much fun as a team. Oh, my God. We had a lot of laughs. Uh, You know, uh, we had some real comedians in that group, uh, especially Riccatello and Lessing. You know, they're just very, very funny guys. Uh, Very Yeah, so a lot of fun, a lot of fun to be around. It needs to be noted that the main organisers, Carol Galli and Carol Bertrand, had made big improvements since the 1993 test event. Here's John Lilly writing again in 220 magazine. Quote, It was a huge step forward for triathlon. No one previously had attempted such an undertaking. And apart from some small problems, the whole race worked well. The athletes enjoyed the camaraderie of team racing and the spectators and television viewers got a good look at the sport of triathlon over a period of several days, end quote. Scott was also impressed. Yes, yes, that was, it was, it was very professional, the whole thing. I remember Carol Gady, uh, the race organiser, I thought she did a fabulous job with everything, uh, the marshalling, the, the moving the whole bit from place to place, just like the Tour de France does, you know, the start, the finish, the road closures. Um, It was all extremely well done. Scott kept a diary during his trip that was published in the December 1994 issue of Triathlete. I love how it ends. Quote, On the trip home, I started to envisage a two-week tour with more than a few longer stages interspersed. It's not hard to get pumped up about that. Congrats to the organisation that pulled it all together. Please keep me on your mailing list. End quote. 
Unfortunately, Scott didn't get to go back. He decided to end his long and successful professional career during the 1995 season. However, like me, he thinks it would be great to see the format come back. I hope somebody takes that concept and really runs with it. You know, um, now with Super League and, um, you know, which is, which is great. It's fantastic. You know, um, that was a concept uh, that started in, in Australia in the 80s. And uh, Chris McCormick brought it back. And, um, and now, of course, we have indoor racing and, and um, Zwift racing and, you know, all sorts of racing. And I, I, I think the time is right for, uh, for a stage race, you know, a really demanding stage race. And I, I have a feeling the pros would really embrace it. With a special request for longer stages, because as the France Iron Tour continued into 1995 and onwards, most days became sprint races. Yeah, yeah, which, which I thought was a real shame because, you know, it, the idea to emulate the Tour de France, I thought, was a great idea. And um, I, I thought the stages would get longer and harder and just the opposite happened. Thanks for listening. I hope Scott and myself have enabled you to get a feel for an event that inspired me as a young, ambitious triathlete. An event that doesn't exist anymore, at least not in the same scope, four or more days with the world's best athletes attending. I'm as obsessed with the France Iron Tour now as I was back then. And in 2024, I'm even thinking of heading down to southeastern France to recreate the whole race from Vichy to Alpe d'Huez. I'm also definitely going to look at the 1995 France Iron Tour soon, and then 1996 and maybe 1997. Some of the France Info team went back in 1995, so I'll try and make contact with them. In 1996, there was a mainly British team taking part, sponsored by Haribo, so I already know who I want to speak to for that episode. Remember to check out the show notes at thestreakpodcast.com forward slash podcast forward slash eight. If you've got a question, a correction, some extra historical information, or just want to say hi, then you can email me at thestreakpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you.